Welcome to uh, Pekarna TV uh, TV show and TV interview. Uh, I have a man with an ap- apocalyptic name <laughs> with me, Benjamin Ladra. <laughs> Benjamin is an uh, is an activist for a better world. You are traveling from Sweden, from Göteborg, yes. since August 5th, and you are doing a walk for Palestine. You're on a, you're on a, a personal mission. You're a man with a plan. <laughs> so please tell me a bit more about it. Yeah, so I'm uh, walking to Palestine, as you said. Mm-hmm. And uh, the plan is to raise as much attention and awareness as possible for the situation in Palestine, Mm -hmm. the human rights abuses committed against Palestinians and the illegal military occupation by the Israeli forces since uh, 50 years ago. This is the 50th uh, anniversary of the occupation Mm -hmm. and it's also the 100th anniversary of the Balfour Declaration. That's when the British invaded Palestine after the First World War. Mm -hmm. So to talk about these issues, spread awareness and talk a bit about how the Israelis are throwing Palestinian kids in jail (laughs) and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I'm walking there. So you chose this year uh, for that uh, reason you just mentioned because of these anniversaries. It's it's an important year. It's an important year. So you are planning to walk uh, around 5000 kilometers on foot. Yeah, something like that. Why on foot? Because it's very difficult. Okay. <laughs> it is very difficult, and that's exactly the reason. I mean, people wouldn't care, and I wouldn't sit here if I took the plane, mm-hmm. or if I drove a car, or maybe even if I took the bike, it's too easy. Mm-hmm. But the most difficult way to travel is to walk, or at least the most uh, takes the longest time, and people notice it. Mm -hmm. So the more difficult time I have, the more I struggle, the more attention I think I will gain and I will use that attention to promote or to just raise awareness about the Palestinian situation and Mm -hmm. to talk about how it is for Palestinians. Mm -hmm. So this weather, this winter is only uh, an addition to your uh, struggle? Yeah, I mean when I can take some pictures of me walking in a blizzard with snow everywhere and like walking through walk through a tunnel filled with water, I had water yeah. all over my, uh, up, up to here. Yeah. It's good, <laughs> because people say like, wow, you're really struggling. And uh, the media also notices it more when you're having a difficult time. Mm-hmm. What is your luggage on your journey? This flag? And yeah, I carry you? this big flag. And what else? Uh, so I started with just my backpack mm-hmm. and this flag, but uh, eventually uh, I had s- a lot of problems with my feet, lots of uh, blisters. Mm-hmm. So I got the idea if I just have a wagon, it's something with wheels that I can put this yeah. stupid heavy backpack on so yeah. it would be easier. So eventually I got a baby stroller, like the wagon for kids. Yeah. And. Uh, but when I got that, I realized I can have more stuff. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I sent for my laptop from Sweden so I can uh, be more active on social media. Mm-hmm. And uh, I have a little drone that can film me mm-hmm. while I'm walking. So I'm walking like this and the drone just circulates and films me. So I can put that online as well yeah. to give more attention because it's quality footage. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, I have my clothes, of course. I have a little like cooking pots, Mm -hmm. little fire, little uh, pots and pans to make some food. Mm -hmm. Not really using it that much, but uh, in emergency I can make my own food. I have my tent, of course, to Mm -hmm. sleep in. So it's a lot of stuff. (laughs) How do people react when they see you? A a guy with a stroller and a drone uh, about his head? Yeah, they call the police. (laughs) They call the police. And the flag, of course. Yeah, almost every day I get to meet these officers, Mm -hmm. which sometimes speak English and sometimes do not. (laughs) Okay. And uh, yeah, it's very, very annoying having to explain your existence to authorities that Mm -hmm. have the power to do whatever they want Mm -hmm. all the time. Did did you have some uh, negative experience? Did they try to throw you? Yeah, Yeah. of course. (laughs) Did they throw you in jail? Did they try to throw you in jail? No, they threatened it sometimes. Mm -hmm. In Germany, I was flying with my drone uh, on a big field where they were growing like potatoes or something, Mm -hmm. and the police came and said, "Like this is illegal." And I I read the laws in Germany; it's not illegal to fly over 
were big feel no nobody was there but they said yeah it's illegal so I said no show me the law and this refused to speak English and they refused of course to <laughs> reference any law and then they just said uh, either you give us your address or we or you come with us to the police station and I'm having all this luggage that don't yeah. have and they told me it would be a 50 euro fine, so I said, all right, sure, whatever to make you go away, you can extort money from me if you want, yeah. but uh, it's more worth it than uh, taking too much of my time going somewhere I don't know where, and then I will have to walk back somehow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And also in Austria, somebody called them and told them, told them I was a terrorist, so like terror alerted police are very aggressive mm -hmm. and violent mm -hmm. and screaming also in German with their guns drawn and everything mm -hmm. so I'm sitting at a cafe uh, I have the window just beside me and outside the window is my luggage mm -hmm. my big baby stroller with my flag mm -hmm. sitting drinking my coffee and I notice a lot of police showing up and of course I know it's because of me it's always because of me yeah and uh, Two of them entered the cafe, or I waved to them, so they come into the cafe and yeah. ask me, like, is this yours? And I say, yeah, so they say, come outside. And uh, they start, <laughs> and I come outside with my hands in my pocket, so they say, why are you holding your hands in the pocket? So I say, for no reason, <laughs> what's in the bag? It's just my clothes, show us. Mm -hmm. Then I start opening it, and then this touch screen is stop <laughs> in German, and I see they're holding their guns outside. I say, okay, mm -hmm. telling me to open my bag, and then telling me to stop. Yeah. What do you want? <laughs> yeah. A really crazy experience. I'm not used to having guns pointed at me, but I, I believe uh, a peacemaker as, as yourself. Yeah, it's always like this. I have. A, I used to say that saying, saving the world will always be illegal mm -hmm. because the power structures are the ones. They are usually the problem, and they are also the ones setting the law. Mm -hmm. And of course, changing them would be against the law, so that will always be illegal. Mm -hmm. And usually, great struggles have involved breaking the law in one way or another. Yeah. I mean, civil disobedience, the whole concept is to be disobedient. Yeah. So, of course, police will always harass people that are working for justice, mm -hmm. for human rights, trying to have peace and equality, mm -hmm. because that challenges some power structures, and they are in control of the police. Mm -hmm. And unless the police have the moral authority over themselves to refuse orders, at which point they stop becoming police, if they are not doing the police job anymore, but becoming autonomous individuals, mm -hmm. then they will always be these soldiers for big corporations, for big states, which wants to control and dominate populations. Exactly. You have been to Palestine before. Uh, uh, yeah, let, let's to switch. <laughs> yeah, uh, we will come back to, to these questions. But let's go to Palestine with you. Uh, you have been to Palestine before. What is life like? <laughs> so I was in uh, the West Bank. Yeah. Uh, I visited uh, Nablus, Hebron, and uh, Ramallah mostly. Mm -hmm. And life there is very difficult. Okay. They are living under a military occupation since 50 years, since the 1967 invasion of Palestine. And Israel also occupied parts of Syria and uh, big parts of Egypt. Parts of Syria are still occupied to this very day by Israel. Mm -hmm. And they, the UN released a report condemning their policies as policies of apartheid and mm -hmm. committing the crime of apartheid against Palestinians. So they are living under military law. They have uh, it's the soldiers that make up the law on the spot. They can arrest anyone they want, and they do it. Mm -hmm. uh, July this year, 320 children were arrested or were imprisoned. Mm -hmm. Children below 18. I have seen pictures of young children as young as six, seven getting arrested and taken to prisons by mm -hmm. soldiers. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, daily house raids, they raid houses in the middle of the night, they start knocking on your door if you don't open, they smash the door, mm -hmm. uh, wake everybody up, force them to sit in some corner, maybe arrest one of the family members. Mm -hmm. They always, Palestinians always have the fear, of course, mm -hmm. of anyone you know or anyone that you love can be arbitrarily arrested. Mm -hmm. There is no, there are no rules for the arrests either. They have an uh, a policy called administrative detention, okay. which means incarceration without a trial and uh, for as long as they feel like it. So anyone can be incarcerated for any amount of time, anytime, anywhere in the West Bank, and you have this threat hanging over you. 
and as soon as you protest, you will the whole city will be drowned in tear gas. Mm-hmm. They're shooting tear gas into people's homes as well. Children have died this way. They have suffocated old people, people with uh, diseases or weak lungs or something like that. Mm-hmm. I read about one case where a mother they had just fired tear gas into the home. She had a baby. He was under one year old. So, uh, and she had uh, a friend on the, she was on the second floor, friend uh, on, the, on the ground. Mm-hmm. She drops the baby to her friend to save the baby's life. Yeah. That's the decisions they have to take sometimes to drop your baby from another floor, I think it was the second floor, mm-hmm. to have your baby not suffocate because the army shoots tear gas into your home. And these are maybe one uh, <laughs> 0,001% of all the cases you can talk about and all the ways of describing the situation of life for Palestinians. Mm-hmm. And uh, that is... Uh, that was uh, the... Uh, I'm sorry, I'm a bit shaken by, by this story now. <laughs> it's not easy to hear and this yeah. is exactly why I'm doing this journey as well exactly. because first of all the media will not tell you these stories or they might just fly past you and you won't really notice them. Mm-hmm. You want the educational system, at least in Sweden and I think in most of Europe, probably most of the world, don't really teach you the situation for people living in other countries, especially Palestine. Mm-hmm. So you will never you will never see the pictures, hear the stories if you don't uh, meet someone that will tell you mm-hmm. or if you find out by yourself. Mm-hmm. And I find this to be one of the great obstacles to peace, of course, because we need to put pressure to stop human rights abuses. Mm-hmm. Human rights abuses thrive in the dark and they fear the light of transparency and the light of uh, people knowing. So to pierce through the mm-hmm. cloud, the shroud that is surrounding these human rights abuses that are taking place on a daily basis, I felt the need. I can go out and speak to some people, teach some people, hopefully they will get engaged and maybe we can be even more people that are being even more vocal and Mm -hmm. try to do something about this terrible occupation. Yeah, I have a little, uh, I had a little question for you but now you answered it by yourself. (laughs) I wanted to ask you if you agree that the main obstacle in reaching peace is fear, fear of unknown. And that is... Fear of the unknown, yeah. Exactly what you said before. Yeah, also the main obstacle to peace is the unwillingness to have peace from the United States and the Israeli side, the policies and the government. They are. So, uh, (laughs) I like to borrow David Sheen, which is an independent Israeli journalist's way of explaining the (laughs) different solutions that people are talking about, two state, one state, and he has two more. So the two states would be on the 67 borders, a Palestinian state with East Jerusalem as its capital, Mm -hmm. which now that Trump never recognized uh, or declared Jerusalem as the Israeli capital, Mm -hmm. it doesn't seem likely that that will happen. The one state solution, which would be a binational state with a democracy where everyone can live and vote, Mm -hmm. which would mean an end to the Jewish ethnocracy. Okay. where they give out rights based on ethnicity. They can't do that if they want to have a democracy and one state where everybody has equal rights. So the Israelis aren't really interested in having a one-state solution either because mm-hmm. they want to have a Jewish state, uh, which in my personal opinion is very, very bad. If you base a state on ethnicity and on religion, like uh, People don't really like the Islamic State, uh, the IS, and I agree with them. Mm -hmm. Basing a state on religion and on ethnicity is wrong, Mm -hmm. because that will (laughs) always discriminate and lead to terrible abuses against minorities and people not belonging to that religion or that ethnicity. Mm -hmm. Uh, This two-state solution would (laughs) technically allow this for Israel to still have a Jewish state, which uh, yeah, we can have opinions about it, but at least the Palestinians would have their state as well, where they can live without being discriminated. The mm-hmm. one state would eliminate that, and the Israelis don't want it. So, not, and what we have today is another situation. We have the domination situation, the apartheid situation. Mm-hmm. In reality, one state. I mean, the Palestinians don't control their own borders. They don't control their own life. They are subjugated by a military occupation. Mm-hmm. So we have the one state and without the democracy, without the equal rights, the domination state. 
and there's the even worse alternative, which is the elimination alternative, just ethnically cleanse the Palestinians, mm-hmm. throw them out, get rid of them, and have a Jewish ethnocracy. Mm-hmm. And uh, different people are pursuing different alternatives. Mm-hmm. I think maybe the two-state alternative would be a good one, but uh, it's not really important to talk about at this moment. Mm. The only thing that matters is ending the military occupation and what comes next can only be something more positive than what we have today. So that will always be. No solution can ever include a military occupation which subjugates and dominates and kills an entire population. Mm. That's no solution. That's not peace. So that needs to end. Mm-hmm. And the rest, political speculation, maybe for <laughs> smarter people or yeah. academics or whoever. I want to be a part of that debate too, of mm-hmm. course, but it can't, it feels very strange to talk about that when we still have the military occupation, which doesn't seem to end very soon. Mm-hmm. It's been going on for 50 years this year. Mm-hmm. So that's really what I <laughs> see as a step, a huge step towards any solution that would be viable for a viable peace for all people, for Israelis as well, they're not safe mm-hmm. if they conduct war, if they conduct ethnic cleansing and like enrage an entire population. If you kill someone else, their, pe- their parents, their friends will be angry at you and mm-hmm. you will have conflict. If you incarcerate someone else's children, if you continually <laughs> dominate and subjugate another population, they will be angry and there will be retaliation. Mm-hmm. The extreme parts of the, those uh, that population will of course do more extreme things and if you want to avoid that you need to stop creating reactions. Mm-hmm. So taking steps to peace is also for the Israelis to have. Mm-hmm. Because we're all people. And yeah, we are all they, people. They are people, the Israelis, the Palestinians are people and if they are ever to live together uh, the military occupation needs to stop. That's it. That's it. So uh, you are, uh, I see you as a, as a peace ambassador. You would agree with me, <laughs> of course. <laughs> And self-proclaimed. <laughs> self-proclaimed. Proclaimed by others. <laughs> and uh, I'm really interested to hear, is this your first uh, fight, non-violent fight, uh, word fight, a walking fight for a, for a greater cause, for well, peace? It is the first walking fight. It is the first walking fight. Okay? I never walked before like this. Okay. I didn't train anything either. I just... Uh, as soon as I had enough money, I saved money for about a year to be able to afford this, okay. to buy all the equipment I needed and have money to not starve, money for food. Mm-hmm. Uh, when I had that, I just stepped out the door mm-hmm. and uh, walked for the entire day until I found a little place to put up my tent. Mm-hmm. And the next day I packed my tent and started walking again. The end. Every day like that until, and now I'm in Maribor in Slovenia. Yeah. That took me five months, five months. <laughs> to okay. get here. Okay. But I've done other things, of course, in my life. I mean, uh, the Palestinians don't have a monopoly on suffering, mm-hmm. but uh, right now I feel very strongly for their case, of course, and mm-hmm. I chose to do this because their case is a case that we don't really talk about, and the ignorance is like enormous. But I am very well aware, I've been a part of other struggles as well. Mm -hmm. The environmental struggle, for example, Mm -hmm. to avoid a global apocalypse, Mm -hmm. which would be the global warming, will create millions and millions of refugees, people dying, wars over resources. So when I was walking through Germany, I took part in uh, Ende Gelände, which is uh, a big civil disobedience action against the coal mining industry. Okay. They have big coal mines in the Rhineland, the western part of Germany, where they extract big night coal from the ground. Um, part of it is killing people. They are like just digging out huge chunks of land where villages lay and they were just evicted from their homes and their homes destroyed. Mm-hmm. And then uh, burning this coal, creating huge amounts of uh, carbon dioxide, accelerating global warming, mm-hmm. it means accelerating our demise. So we were a couple of thousand people walking into this mine and <laughs> sort of shutting it down for a day. Uh, mm-hmm. Thousands of police as well. I got uh, arrested twice, pepper spray, beaten. One police officer walked up to me and just punched me hard in the face. My glasses were like, uh, I fixed them now, but they were really broke yeah. because he punched me. And uh, yeah, the fight for the climate is very important. It almost takes precedence over everything else because without the planet we have nothing. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, so I did that on the way. <laughs> on the way, <laughs> to excellent. Because it was sort of on the way. <laughs> it was a little sub mission uh, uh, in Europe. Yeah, I mean, if I would see a big uh, demonstration or a civil disobedience action on my way, which I did there, of course I would take part in it. And uh, there's a lot of struggles that I also want to engage in, of course. I don't have unlimited time. I mean, I have my 24 hours. I'm trying to use them as best as I can. Yeah. Which brings me to another interesting question. Uh, what do you think about when you're walking, when you're not engaging in a civil disobedience, <laughs> arguing with officers? <laughs> what are you thinking about? Well, lots of things. I mean, I have so much time by myself. Yeah. A lot of time. More time than I ever had in my life. Yeah. To think about everything and nothing. Mm -hmm. Try to keep my thoughts <laughs> in check and in balance, not to run off somewhere very negative or existential despair or something like that. Yeah. Happens. And sometimes I think about, uh, of course, I think about my girlfriend. I have a girlfriend back in Sweden. And my family a bit, and my friends, and uh, I try to watch lectures because if I spend too much time without listening to music or mm -hmm. watch something, then uh, then it's more difficult because you notice that your legs are really hurting, you're mm -hmm. very hungry, you're cold, all these things. So in order to keep that in check, I try to occupy my mind with something else. Mm -hmm. And uh, free roaming in the EU means that you can watch YouTube, okay. which means that you can watch TED Talks, you can watch lectures, you can watch great people talking about uh, all the things you're interested in, new things that you discover. Mm -hmm. So I try to... Yeah. Keep yourself entertained. Uh, yeah, and, and your mind. Keep, keep, uh, keep learning. Keep because learning. there's a lot of people that have a lot to teach, and we need to listen to them. Mm -hmm. When you lose uh, energy, when you lose stamina, uh, when you when you had an, a difficult uh, argument with an officer, what is that thing, that little sparkle that you hold on to? in your mission? Is it, is it a memory? Is it a, a, of Palestine? What is that? Well, I try to keep things in perspective. Okay. <laughs> and okay. Uh, it's also a great antidote to political depression to mm -hmm. take action and do something. Okay. And uh, I'm too aware <laughs> of the Palestinian case and situation. Mm -hmm. And being aware of problems and really feeling problems for other people, yeah, it will frustrate you, it will create you a big deal of unease mm -hmm. and you will feel the motivation to do something and I can sort of rest against the fact that I know that I am doing something which uh, calms these emotions down just a little bit yeah. that I know about this great injustice but at least I'm doing what I can at the moment and I can't really do much more than I'm doing at the moment this is at this moment maybe I can in the future mm -hmm. and I also try to keep perspective that uh, I'm Swedish, mm -hmm. I have my Swedish passport, I'm born in Sweden, <laughs> so that gives me all the privileges that I could ever imagine, almost. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not starving in Yemen, I'm having cholera, I'm not being bombed by Saudi Arabia, mm -hmm. I'm not being arrested by a Palestinian a Israeli soldier and put in jail and tortured, yeah. I am not persecuted, mm -hmm. I'm not a minority, I, I am a man, I have all these privileges that's just makes me feel that I don't really have so much to complain about. Mm -hmm. uh, what can we do? What can all of us, the rest of us, do? What you are already doing uh, to make uh, our world a better place? There is so much. <laughs> there is so much that you can do. Please so tell me. Like, uh, your imagination really sets your limit. Okay. So, uh, First, you can find people that are already doing stuff and you can join them. If you see that there's a demonstration, you can join it, a manifestation or something like that. If there's none and you feel like there should be one, you can uh, organize one yourself. Uh, I organized a hunger strike in my city, Gothenburg, in Sweden, which was possible. I just called the police and I would go into a hunger strike in the middle of the city with a big tent and flags everywhere and they said, uh, um, okay. okay. <laughs> So I got the permission after some uh, arguments <laughs> and uh, called, uh, I just googled everyone that had something to do, this was for Palestine as well, mm -hmm. to have something to do with Palestinians and I got to borrow a lot of flags from a Palestinian organization, I got to borrow a big tent from another organization, I called all my friends and I gathered around 10 people that did a solidarity hunger strike. Mm -hmm. uh, 
I had a phone, I guess. Most people have a phone. That's all I needed, really, as mm -hmm. an initiative. You can also help yourself and educate yourself if you don't feel that you are really motivated about any issue, then you can read more about any issue and it will bring you motivation. Mm -hmm. If you feel that you are already motivated, but asking, like you are, what can I do? Yeah. You can read about the history of resistance and social, social change. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you can read about all the different ways you can do civil disobedience uh, okay. actions. You can uh, have book circles. You can uh, screen documentaries. You can watch them yourself. You can uh, give them to your parents. You can organize them in public. Mm -hmm. If there is no documentary that you like, you can create your own documentary. Go mm -hmm. out there, read, learn, talk to people, mm -hmm. and uh, also strengthen yourself. Yeah. Work with your confidence and with your abilities because the more secure and safe and strong you are, mm -hmm. the better you are at helping other people as well. Mm -hmm. If you are very insecure and feel very unsafe and not very stable, then uh, it will be more difficult for you to do more for others mm -hmm. because we need to take care of ourselves first. And I feel very strong and confident and secure so I can do this for others. Mm -hmm. But if I didn't have these uh, mindset or qualities, then I would need to work on that first. Of course. And really your mind is the biggest obstacle to your imagination. And then try to spend some time coming up with ideas. Just think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> spend Just some, think. Yeah. Spend some time thinking. I came up with the idea of walking and then uh, after you finished thinking and came up with an idea, you, it's all about initiative and courage to just take the courage to do it. So courage is maybe... Yeah, yeah you need some courage, you need, you need some, some courage. initiative and uh, take, take a risk, it's alright. Mm -hmm. I mean, the worst thing is that you will fail. If I will fail with this journey, fine, at least I tried. <laughs> at least you tried, yeah. Uh, when I was preparing for this interview, and uh, I looked at your Facebook page and I listened uh, to some of your interviews. And um, uh, when I was doing this little research for today, um, a little uh, one citation came uh, to my mind, uh, a citation from um, Martin Luther King Jr., which uh, is perfect uh, for uh, this moment in the in <laughs> interview. And this citation is, you, you will agree, and this citation is those who love peace must learn to organize as effectively as those who love war do you agree yeah it's all about organization i mean i'm sure there are millions of people all over the world that are feeling very frustrated at all the injustice everywhere and they are just sitting at home feeling frustrated if they would just take to the streets, make their opinions heard, be vocal, mm -hmm. if they would do something. I don't really like the term activist. It okay. implies that everyone else is passive. Okay. Because active, active is doing something. Being active to do something. I mean, everybody should do something, right? Why do we even need this term? It implies that some people aren't doing something. Okay. And to everyone that feels like they might be able to do more, they really should just be more vocal. Mm -hmm. Because there are great forces of uh, evil that are destroying us. Global warming is destroying us. War is destroying us. Israel is <laughs> destroying Palestine at the moment. And uh, we need to be as strong and even stronger. The forces that are trying to accomplish peace, accomplish understanding and tolerance and acceptance. Mm -hmm. Human rights don't come cheap. It's a very steep and very difficult struggle that we all should engage in. Mm -hmm. No matter what uh, struggle we choose to engage for transgender rights, it still requires a lot of organization, motivation, courage, initiative, ideas, everything. Mm -hmm. For Palestine, for everything. Mm -hmm. Another quote by Martin Luther King is that the moral arc of the universe bends slowly, but it bends towards justice. Okay. So we will accomplish our goals eventually, maybe mm -hmm. not in our lifetimes, but uh, we need to try. We need to try. Uh, how will your uh, journey uh, continue? You're leaving Maribor tomorrow? Yeah. 
and uh, what? towards Zagreb in Croatia, where I hope to organize some lectures to speak about Palestine and meet some people. Okay. And then uh, a couple of cities in Hungary, mm-hmm. and then a uh, uh, city begins with T, Tira, not Tiramisu, something like that in Romania. Okay. Uh, and then to Serbia, to the capital, mm-hmm. and on to Bulgaria, mm-hmm. to their capital, and then to Turkey. Mm-hmm. And uh, try to visit all the biggest cities and villages on my way, try to try to organize. <laughs> I'm learning a lot about organizing myself because mm-hmm. I need to try to predict when I'm going to arrive at certain places. Mm-hmm. I need to always write to people that I don't know yet and yeah. tell them about what, who I am, what I'm doing and if they can arrange for me to meet some uh, local activists or to arrange a lecture for me so I can have a place to speak about what I'm doing and the case for Palestine. And, mm-hmm. and the media coverage and... Uh, yeah, media coverage also doesn't come for free. Of course. <laughs> I have uh, spent lots of time trying to find journalists, calling them, writing to them, mm-hmm. just to try to get Palestine out in the media because it's not really out <laughs> in the media so much. It is at the moment. But I'm, but I'm seeing that it starts to fade. Mm-hmm. Trump recognized Jerusalem four days ago, five days ago maybe. Yeah. And uh, now media is losing interest again. So we had Palestine for a couple of days. <laughs> it's not enough. It's not enough. Uh, thank you, uh, Benjamin. Uh, it was a great honor for me to, to <laughs> meet you and to, to have this interview oh, with you. It's very nice of you to have me. <laughs> um, I see you. I see you as a, as a fighter, uh, as a non-military fighter, and um, your weapons are uh, uh, your words. I can see that you you truly believe uh, in your cause, and I wish you all the luck. And I wish uh, that you continue to mobilize uh, uh, the uh, <laughs> people of this world to um, to uh, help us fight uh, in, in in better world and to fight for peace because we, we need to fight for peace power never concedes without a demand and we are at the demand we need to demand something from our leaders politicians from the power structures because they will never do the right thing unless pushed to do the right thing and the more we are pushing the more right things will come so we need to just start putting pressure Thank you. This was uh, Benjamin from Sweden, on the way to Palestine. (laughs) Thank you, Benjamin. Thank you.